welcome to another exciting episode of Tea or Coffee on High Impact Television. My name is Mudipa Jacobs and I have with me in the studio. We're our Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. How was your night? Awesome, thank you. And okay. how was yours? Fine, it was good. Okay. Yes. So, today, mm -hmm. we'll be talking about something interesting. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. And um, interesting and quite sensitive, yes. I must say. Yes. So, um, can you do us the honor of saying Okay, the topic? today we'll be talking about the inclusive education okay. for children with cerebral palsy. Okay. And cerebral palsy, when I'm, I mean, is that the disorder that affects the muscle movement okay. and, you know, affects some parts of the body. It's actually a disorder that, okay. you know, mo in some situation, it mm -hmm. can actually affect the brain okay. and cause brain, brain damage. Okay. But now we're looking at, does that now make them um, disabled? Okay. Because even in the, that issue, okay. there are actually ability, there are things they can do, there, okay. especially for, well, we're focusing on children, mm -hmm. there are things they can do, how to cope in school, how to cope with their peers, okay. you know, it, it doesn't now make them, you don't have stigmatize mm -hmm. based on what they are going through, mm -hmm. they are also part of the society and, you know. And you know that um, it is a brain damage, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, happens, is caused by a brain damage that mm -hmm. occurs before or even, you know, after birth. And then I wonder if it's, that's the only way one can have cerebral palsy, yes. you know, because there are some cases where people have accidents that mm -hmm. affect their brain, which mm -hmm. eventually leads to, you know, cerebral, cerebral palsy. palsy. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, the reason why I said this case is quite sensitive because it touches a very sensitive part of me. You know, I have quite a number of experiences, experiences okay. like that. And, you know, okay, let me share one. You know, um, I went for a training and then um, there was a very beautiful lady, you know, she, she had cerebral palsy mm -hmm. and then she also came for the training. And then she had def them difficulty, you know, entering the... The hall, training yes, the hall where we had the training. And then we had to carry her into, you know, the hall. But then the management of that particular, you know, training decided mm -hmm. to build a special entrance for her okay. to enable, you know, her wheelchair enter into the hall. And, you know, I think that that is a very, very amazing yes. way of yes. helping out, you know, and not just ignoring needs because, you know, there are people with special needs and they need to be treated with respect and their needs are supposed to be held, you know, with utmost regard. And, you know, I've, I felt that that was really that amazing. That was a good one. And if everyone, you know, can take can such like steps and actions. Because yes. you find out that there are some people with these disorders and, you know, they feel very not comfortable with um, amongst people in mm -hmm. society. They feel left out. Mm -hmm. They feel, which can actually lead to depression. Mm -hmm. You know, if care is not different taken. kind of thoughts comes to their mind. Mm -hmm. And most times this situation is not caused by them. Mm -hmm. It could be something they probably found themselves in. Okay. Yes, and we shouldn't use it against them. At all. We, you see, the experience you just shared now mm -hmm. takes me to... You know, while I was in, um, in school okay. also, I had a friend that had the issue of cerebral palsy. Okay. And, you know, every time she doesn't want to get involved in conversation because she feels... Left out. Like, left out. She okay. feels like she'll probably not understand or have an idea of what you are talking about okay. or what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And most times... Teachers try to, you know, create this connection between mm -hmm. them and friendly conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, once in a while, our teacher can just call her and have a conversation with her. How are you doing today? Okay. I was home. More of spreading what love. You, yes, spreading love. Make them feel among, make them feel that, yes, they are also important mm -hmm. and they are also, you know, useful to the society. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so let's not talk you know, do all the talking yes. because we have an authority, someone that is in the position to talk more on our topic for mm -hmm. today. But, you know, we'll have to go on a short break. And when we come back, we'll go straight into what we have for today. And you will be meeting our beautiful guest. Please do stay glued. <music>
have a thrilling and bonding experience at High Impact Planet Amusement Park and Resort. Enjoy an amazing retreat in our extremely secured environment with our breathtaking rides. Set goals for the upcoming year in our convenient multi-purpose halls. Bond between team members while giving your staff a desirable treat. High Impact Planet. Fun just got real. Welcome back. This is still Tio Coffee on High Impact Television. If you are just joining us, and of course, we are the first full HD TV station in Nigeria. Okay, so before we went on that break, we told you about the topic of today, mm -hmm. which is, you know, inclusive education for s children with, with cerebral, cerebral palsy. palsy. Yes. And we tried to share our experiences that we've had beautiful we've had, ones yes. i must say you know where people have been supportive have been showing love and we said this would be nice if everyone you know can be like that especially to love, children especially to children and when it comes to the edu educational sector is important that you know they get the right education mm -hmm. quality education, education i must say okay so to do justice this topic is Toby Loba Ajayi. She is a disability management advocate mm -hmm. and she's here in the studio here with us. You're Good welcome. morning. Good morning. Thank You're you for welcome. having me. Yes. It's our pleasure. Okay. So I, I would have, you know, given your profile, but I want you, you know, to tell us what you do. Okay, so short version. Mm -hmm. I am a disability management advocate. Those are just big words to say mm -hmm. okay. that I help families that are raising children with cerebral palsy make the okay. right decisions concerning the care, management, and education of their children, okay. especially those in Nigeria, of course, because okay. <laughs> I'm a Nigerian, yes. right? Um, so pretty much a lot of what I do starts with counseling and um, helping parents find the right doctors, find the right therapists, find the right schools, support schools that are providing inclusive education for children with cerebral palsy. And of course that has ballooned into teacher trainings and then you know upskilling teachers to, to fill the skill gap in teaching children that have actual needs. Okay, so in 2017, yeah. you launched Let the CP, CP kids, so the learn. kids Learn. Yes. yes. So how, what came, how did you, the passion that led, you know, to start it? Uh, I always say that Let's If Kids Learn was born out of parents just wanting more for their children. Okay. Um, in 2016, I was on the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders. And mm -hmm. at the end of my academic institute, my institute made a video. So they did okay. make a video for every single fellow that was in the institute that year. Okay. And they do it for every fellow every year. Mm -hmm. And of course, when they're done, they put the videos on their YouTube pages and then share it on Facebook and then tag the fellow, right? Kind of normal. But on, in my video, they tagged me and then it went viral. Like, kind of, kind of viral where you have mm -hmm. 4,000 views on the video in 24 yeah. hours. And, and everybody kept thinking, okay, so what's, so what's the big deal? Even, like, my institute had to call me, like, Toby, what's going on with your video? Why is it going viral? I was like, I don't know people. <laughs> like, but then... I realized that it was going viral. People were sharing it and tagging parents who were raising children with cerebral palsy, saying, look at this person living with cerebral palsy who's 30 years old, mm -hmm. who has a master's degree, mm -hmm. who's Nigerian. And so parents started storming to my inbox saying, did you go to school abroad? We hear you were raised abroad. And I'm thinking, nope. I am in the US right now on a sponsored fellowship, but I went to school in Lagos. I didn't even go to like Hybro schools. I went to schools in Agege and in places where, you know, you would think, oh, they're not so enlightened. Mm -hmm. And so I don't understand what people are talking about. And then parents started to say to me, well, the schools won't take our children, so how did your parents do it? And in my head, I'm thinking, that's not possible. I went to regular schools. What do you mean the schools won't take your children? So the first parent said it, second parent said it, third parent said it. By the time I got the same thing from seven parents, parents. I knew, okay, maybe there's mm -hmm. some truth in this. I mean, it's, it's okay if one person or two people tell you a lie. By the time some people tell you the same thing, mm -hmm. there has to be some element of truth in it. 
So I came back to Nigeria and started to ask my friends who were teachers and educators and school owners and saying, guys, I hear something about you guys and I'm not sure if it's true. And, to, and my friends were honest. They were like, Toby, the truth is, <laughs> we wouldn't take someone like you to D in our schools. Mm -hmm. That could hurt. Mm -hmm. It didn't hurt as much as it shocked me. Because I was like, really? I mean, on this, knowing what I know about statistics about cerebral palsy in Nigeria, mm -hmm. knowing that one in every 90 children born in Nigeria today is diagnosed with cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. and knowing that our birth rate as a nation is 5 million children per year, True. I'm thinking, so what exactly is our plan for these kids? And nobody else seemed to think it was a big deal. I mean, everybody else just kept saying, oh, but you know these children can't learn, you know. And I kept thinking, what kind of assumption is that? And, of course, the parents that had reached out to me uh, were parents who knew their children had value, mm -hmm. who knew their children could do more than they were being given the chance to and wanted more for their kids. So it started with saying, you know what, even if it's the seven parents, I need to help them. Help. Okay. And that's how the Let's Be Kids Learn project was born because mm -hmm. it went from those seven right. to over 100 right now. All right, so why do you think people actually have that mentality about um, people living with cerebral palsy? Well, I think it's cultural. So there are a lot of factors. There's the cultural factor, there's the religious factor, and then there's just plain assumptions. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so culturally, once a child looks different, we have different names for it. And those names are basically supposed to just define what the child is about. Mm -hmm. So the Yoruba culture would say something like Abiru. And once you call a child Abiru, you've just basically, you know, written that child off. Mm -hmm. So that cultural perspective, perspective. is, on, is mm -hmm. on the table. And then you have the religious perspective that thinks the child is possessed by a demon or being mm -hmm. oppressed by That's a demon. Right. So if the child is being oppressed by a demon, we need to be casting out the demon, demon. not talking about school. So there's that. And then there's just plain ignorance um, mm -hmm. and assumption. You know, so because cerebral palsy is um, a condition that's characterized by damage to the developing brain, people assume that because the parts that control muscles are damaged, mm -hmm. the child's intellectual capacity is inhibited, which isn't always true. But you see, because for a very long time, people haven't given these children a chance, so they end up not being able to, and so we say they can't. So you see how this is a very interesting circle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because they never got a chance to try. Try. And so that's how we got to this point of assumption and then saying, oh, these children cannot learn. Mm -hmm. I will agree with you, actually, that, you know, it's mere assumptions mere because assumption, I've had yes. classmates with, living with cerebral palsy that are exceptionally brilliant. Thank you. You know, and you are a living proof, I must I mean, say. Yes. I, I, and that was know. the shocking part when they <laughs> go, you should learn cannot learn. I mean, my brother was like, can't they see you? Exactly. Like, you mean extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. You freaking have a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And no, we didn't pay for it. You earned your master's degree. Mm -hmm. So why would somebody say that? Say that. So why would somebody, you know, put a single brush stroke over all oh, children? Yes with their palsy and say that they cannot learn without even giving them a chance to try. Okay. You know. So, now, I want to know, how were you able to, you know, to cope? Because looking at you, I see confidence. Oh, I yeah. see someone that has a very healthy self-esteem. Mm -hmm. You know, so how were you able to boost it? How were you able to stand, you know, learning, knowing that some people might talk, mm -hmm. you know, and every other thing that challenges that you might have faced, how were you able to cope? I always say it's kind of... It's not kind of. It is how I was raised. Okay. Um, so I was raised in the. I was raised by very confident parents and in a very confident household. So I'm the fourth of fifth children. So five children. So you cannot. I mean, first of all, the trying to chance me die from home. And so my mom would be like, and so if I would go and report and be like, this person took. She's like, eh. Go and deal with this now. As in, deal with why should why should I come and defend you? You're all siblings. Mm -hmm. Deal with the fact that your sister tried to chance you, chance her back or something. And that look, yes, you may have difficulty with movement. You're not stupid. Mm -hmm. So stop acting like you I mean my mom would say, Look, you cannot act like you're stupid around me. I don't have stupid children. You're very smart and you should use your brain. So mm -hmm. your, your siblings are chancing you because they can run. Use your brain to outsmart them. Use what you have. And mm -hmm. so and I, I grew up with that mentality of 
yes, there are things I can't do, but there are things I can do better than everybody else, and I should learn to celebrate that. And so even though people talked, I mean, going to uni was interesting. People would jump out of their hostels to come and stare at me walking down the street. It was kind of a thing mm -hmm. in the, whole, the first two weeks of my part one. But it didn't matter to me much because I was like, oh, yeah, we'll see at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. Because hey, I know what I know what I bring to the exactly. table. So for the for the most part, I think that's one thing that's helped me. Okay. It's understanding the value that I bring to the table, the table. of everything that I do, be mm -hmm. it a workplace, be it a relationship, be it school. Mm -hmm. Understanding the value of what I bring to the table helps me to kind of just throw off everything else. Mm -hmm. So if, okay. even if you don't value it, it's your loss. Because I already know that I have that inherent value. And so it doesn't, you know, it's your it's your choice to be inherently assuming my incompetence, you All lose. Right. All right, so moving to the topic for today, which mm -hmm. is, you know, focusing on the education for children living with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at children living with cerebral palsy, what exactly are they going through? What are they suffering? What are they, what, what, what did they experience on their daily lives? Each person, cerebral palsy is a very individualistic condition, which okay. means that each person is affected differently. Okay. For those of you who've probably had classmates with cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. you will notice that they look different from me um, mm -hmm. and probably have you know, different affectations. Because cerebral palsy affects each child. It's so individualistic. Like if you lined up 15 of us and we all have the same diagnosis, cerebral palsy would look different. different we'll okay. have different needs. We'll have different issues. We'll have different problems. And so there's no one-size-fits-all problem. Mm -hmm. One of the... One of the most common, really, that I can see can be like a generic problem for all of us is the problem of access. Okay. Um, when I say access, it's access to you know public buildings, access to okay. classrooms. You know, you go into public schools and there's stairs everywhere. And okay, and I'm thinking, really, like seriously, how am I supposed to get up that? I'm not supposed to get up there. I mean, I eventually always do, but that's because I can actually, with a little bit of help, I can do it. But what? But with someone on a wheelchair, that becomes virtually impossible unless they're actually four able-bodied men that are willing to carry the person plus the wheelchair up the stairs, which becomes a bit of a challenge. So that is a big issue, you know, with education. And then, again, I always say that the biggest barrier to the education of children with cerebral palsy is assumptions. There's that assumption that this child is going to be impossible to teach, so the child are not even willing to try. And then there's also the assumption of this child can't learn, so why waste my time? Then, of course, it's also the unwillingness to even just think. A lot of the things that are, you know, accommodations and modifications that are supposed to be made for children with cerebral palsy are not rocket science. They are okay. what I like to call common sense. So if a child can't talk, for instance, if you've ever met people with cerebral palsy, you will know that there are some people with cerebral palsy who can't speak clearly mm -hmm. or who can't speak at all. Yeah, correct. So if a child can't talk, for instance, I hear people say, oh, the child can't talk, so why should the child come to school? The question I ask them is, how many oral exams have you written in your life? I mean, the fact that a child isn't talking doesn't mean that they're not learning. Or the, or the most interesting one from preschool teachers, the child can't write. I'm like, how many of us write anything longhand in 2018? So why are we making writing such an issue? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's a lot of the things that we make as barriers for the children in the education sector are things that, have, that can be fixed by common sense if we're just being willing to think. But, you know, that lack of willingness is there. And so okay. that's kind of why we have... So. Sure. With, with, what you, with what you've said now, um, so what do you think should be done as regards the educational sector, especially for children living with cerebral palsy? Because, you know, I feel that um, they should be able to be in the same classrooms yeah. with um, other, other students, other students yeah. Yeah. and learn the same way yeah. they learn. So what do you think can be put in place to ensure this? Okay, so I think that in the course of my work, a few things are found. First of all, is that we make the classrooms accessible to all. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. if I can't get into the classroom, it doesn't matter if you say I'm welcome. You've, you've automatically said I shouldn't come. It's like somebody saying you're welcome, but then they lock the door. Are you actually welcome? So one of the big issues is always access to classrooms. Every time that I train schools and I train teachers, first thing I ask them is, is your school? architecturally accessible to people on wheelchairs. Because if you're not accessible, you've basically, even if you say they're welcome, you've basically shut the door. 
So there's no point. And then the other thing is that we need to train teachers. We need to upskill our teachers to understand that they cannot continue to teach in the same way and expect every child to respond the same way. Because some children just do not have the ability to respond the way that you are expecting. They should be able to learn to vary their teaching vary. styles mm -hmm. and vary their assessment styles. Mm -hmm. And these are things that are honestly not that hard if we're just willing. So teach, you know, and then of course, the biggest thing that can back this thing up is policy. I never really like to talk about policy a lot, even though I'm a lawyer, because I understand mm -hmm. the intricacies of policy making mm -hmm. and then the biggest part, policy implementation. So I always like to talk about things that we can fix, like, like right now, mm -hmm. which is that we can train teachers to know and do better. We can make our classrooms accessible. We can, you know, create individualized learning plans for children that need it. Not all children with cerebral palsy will need an individualized education plan. I didn't. I didn't need one. I was actually even a gifted student. So yes, I was even more of a problem because I was not even taping. I was not even average. I was a little over average. So I would stop the class when I'm done. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, you can create, so that teachers can actually begin to create accommodations and modifications in their classrooms. Something as simple as allowing a student who cannot write to take an oral exam. How hard is that? Okay. You know, something as simple as mm -hmm. that can be the game changer for a child in the classroom. All right. Knowing that cerebral palsy does not determine if a child is intelligent mm -hmm. or brilliant. Now, how do you enforce it into the society? Because it's not only teachers or schools that need to be aware about this. We also they also they're also in society we having interaction mm -hmm. and conversation with people. Now how do you enforce it to people in the society to be aware that okay, you know what? This this, this disorder does not make a child not intelligent or cannot participate in some activities in society. So with societal change, you can't enforce it. You can, in a sense, influence it. So we can influence societal change by, for instance, what we're doing today, which is this interview. So somebody, two, three, five people watch this, mm -hmm. and suddenly they, they're like, oh, really? And then... There's a conversation comes up two weeks from now, mm -hmm. and somebody says, oh, those, those children. And then the person is able to say, actually. No. They so are this more educated. educated. Mm -hmm. you know, so this is how you create societal change. It's by making sure that we continue to create the awareness. Mm -hmm. We continue to correct the wrong narratives. Because the wrong narratives are pervasive. They're mm -hmm. everywhere. There are assumptions everywhere. So it's us correcting those assumptions as we go, everywhere that we find them, in churches, in, you know, I mean, not in a station where you probably, you know, um, someone with a is probably coming down the street and everybody else is going in a different mm -hmm. direction. You know, those are the ways we can correct those things and say it's not contagious. Like, you can't catch it. You can't. Mm -hmm. So it's being able to influence that change by, you know, putting our voices out there and letting people see that it's possible. Okay. Now, how, how do you think you can help a student mm -hmm. with cerebral palsy, you know, to participate actively in class? You know, there are times where you might want to reach out mm -hmm. to something for easy access in yeah. class and participation of activities in class. Okay, so it's simple. It's the always, I always say inclusion is the process of removing barriers. Okay. So what are the barriers to participation? Is the barrier speech, like, is it that the child, the person is unable to speak? Okay. Okay, can the person write their answers so that somebody else reads it out for them? Okay. Or... If the barrier is writing, so instead of writing their answers, can they record it into a voice recorder and then play it out when everybody else is showing their answers? Mm -hmm. Is you know, is the barrier like architectural access? Can we remove those architectural barriers so that the person can move around the class freely and not feel like they're going to fall down or bump into something? You know, so it's about it's just about thinking through what barriers exist for this person in participation and then removing those barriers. And sometimes some of the barriers are also um, internal because, again, I was blessed to be raised in a family where I was raised very self-confident, very, you know, very self-assured. I'm mm -hmm. be sure that I actually, 
I have a lot of value. Not everybody was. I met people with cerebral palsy who have serious low self-esteem issues. And I'm, I'm personally, I'm pissed because I'm like, seriously. But then, again, it goes back to how they were raised and the experiences they've had in their own lives. So sometimes we also have to deal with the fact that some of this lack of participation is not because mm -hmm. they can't. It's because they have a low self-esteem and they feel that they shouldn't. So we might have to also deal with that. Because you can remove all the barriers and they will still not participate because they don't feel like they have mm -hmm. a right to do so. Okay. okay. So still, still talking about the educational sector, we can mm -hmm. see that there is a lot of work to be done. Yeah. There is a lot of work to be done. And would you, would you advise that we have a special school that, you know, has all these things in place for them? Or would you still advise that we infuse it into the, what we have, the educational system that we have now, like having recorders, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. or um, having oral exams mm -hmm. and all the things that you, you advise that we have in place. Should we have that or we should have a special school where they can have this? So I have a simple question for you. When they're done in your special school, um, do you have a separate special environment, a special church, um, a special market? special housing that they're going to live in? Mm -mm. If you don't... <laughs> okay. But you, you might know begin that to we think. have special training centers. Yeah, we do. Yes. But I always say the special education is a service. It shouldn't be okay. a place. Um, the cost... Think about... Just let's think about it cost-wise. Mm -hmm. The cost of um, building a special center mm -hmm. and the cost of just bringing in those extra things extra into your things. existing classrooms, which is cheaper. Okay. You know, I asked that question because we have private schools, we yeah. have public, public schools. schools yeah. yes. yes. For the public schools, it would be easier for the government to, you know, infuse this. For some private schools, might be finding it quite, you yeah. know, Hard or challenging. It actually, again, it's still cheaper for everybody. For everyone. Because let's say the private school said they wanted to build a special center. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it cost them more? True that. It would cost them more, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, is it not easier and cheaper? To train your teachers so that you can teach everybody and then bring these things in okay. into your existing structure. It's always easier. Even in, I mean, I've found, you think government schools are easier to deal with? In the course of my work in training teachers and training schools, the most people who are interested in inclusive education are private schools. They're the ones who actually want to learn how to handle those kids. Because the truth is this. I'm not asking you to do charity. A private school, you still charge your school fees. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. It's increasing the student population. Which private school is not looking for students? <laughs> yes. So, it's, so for them, it's... it's because um, the thing is, I don't make, I, you know, I don't make disability about charity. I never have, and I don't think, I don't think I'll ever be able to do so. Mm -hmm. It's, you're running a business. You're a private school. You're running a business. Mm -hmm. All I'm trying to teach you are skills that make your business grow. Grow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you think about the cost of mm -hmm. making these adaptations versus the income, and it's just, would adjust. Exactly. it's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's just the wise, it's just the wise economic decision mm -hmm. to make. All okay. right, talking about family support and mm -hmm. parenting, because you likely mentioned that your family, your parents, were, you know, they paid full attention, making sure that you do not go down with low self-esteem or depression. Mm -hmm. Now, how can parents, you know, pay more attention to children with suffering from cerebral palsy? How can they pay more attention? How can, you know, put things in right? How can they, how, how how can can they, they get, get things right? right? So, first... You don't suffer from cerebral palsy, you live with cerebral palsy. Okay. Forgive me. That okay. word so far, always, I always correct it. Okay. Um, and I don't think it's paying special attention, you know, quote unquote. I think it's just treating your child the same way you would treat all other children other in your children. family. I mean, you see, that special attention can become a problem because you can now read an entitled child. That doesn't do anything for themselves because they think everybody else owes them and should do it for them. Mm -hmm. If you want to raise a balanced child, you treat your child like you would treat every other child in the family. Yes, of course, because of their limitations, of course, you will make you know, certain adaptations for them all and all of that. Nobody's saying you don't do that. But those start giving special privileges they haven't earned. So, for instance, growing up, um, of course, I couldn't walk for a very long time. So... Um, things like chores, what my mom would do is she had the carpenter make a special chair. So while everybody was, for instance, standing to do the dishes, I mean, I had my own chair and they would push it to the sink and mm -hmm. then put me on it and see your turn okay. to the dishes. 
Same thing with every single child that I had to do. Mm -hmm. They would make those adaptations ready for me to be able to do them. So sometimes I wouldn't, of course, maybe we wouldn't even do the chores well. We probably wash the dishes and they're not clean. My mom's like, it's fine, I'll do it myself again. But you will learn to do those chores mm -hmm. because you're a member of this family and in this family we do chores. Mm -hmm. We're not going to exclude you from anything on the basis of disability. I think that a lot, a lot of the, and that's one of the big things. And then the other thing is explain the disability to your child. So if the child, if you're, if you're doing things differently for a child, they need to know why. Um, I, it always amazes me when I meet adults with cerebral palsy who don't understand what cerebral palsy is. I'm like, how? I mean, it's important that you do that. You explain it to your child so that they understand why they even have these difficulties in the mm -hmm. first place. And then you ensure that you don't hurt them. I, I wasn't got any slack. You know, of course, when I, again, I'm not saying that they didn't make accommodations. For instance, if everybody else was taking public transport, my dad would drive me. Okay. That's fine. But I mean, that, that's a sane accommodation to be made. But that's not to say, oh, well, don't worry. You don't need to make good grades. Just go to school. Eh? In which house? My father said, look, my friend, I'm paying school fees. I want mm -hmm. to see my street aids. <laughs> you... Excuse you. So you have to work extremely work hard, hard exactly. you know, to meet You're not up. allowed to not work hard because mm -hmm. you have a disability. My mom like to say, she, she always said it in Yoruba. She would say, look, my friend, trans loosely translated what she meant was, look, my friend, your muscles may be impaired, but your brain, brain is fine. It's mm -hmm. effective. So therefore, thou shalt not act like a child whose <laughs> brain is not effective. Or else I will beat it out of you. Here. And because she always said, and she, she said it every day. So after a while, people used to be like, even other people ask me, like, you work so hard. hard. What's wrong with you? I was like, see, there are some things that ring that you don't understand. understand. <laughs> you can't be best girl that's that. The way oh, I was okay. raised, I can't be easy. And that's it. It's how you raise your children. Okay. It, that, it's important the things you say to, to, say them, to them, the way that you encourage, encourage them. Yes. It's important. All right. All right. It's really important <laughs> on how you raise your child. Yes. We've been talking with Toby Lover Ajayi. We're going on a short break, and when we come back, we'll have more to talk about inclusive education with children living with cerebral palsy. Welcome back. This is still tea or coffee on high impact television. And just before that break, we have been talking to Toby Loba Ajayi. She is a disability management advocate. An interesting topic, I must say, and um, that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. And while on break, we're having a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would like us to, you know, have it again because I know it benefits, you know, our People viewers. Yes. So about the question I asked earlier about having a special mm -hmm. school or, you know, still infusing these other things that are necessary into the educational system that we have now. Mm -hmm. You know, I was saying, I had a conversation with someone and the person was like, you know, so that children will not be um, maltreated, maltreated or treated in a way they don't like, by you know, well. yes, by teachers okay. or by fellow students. That is the reason why they prefer special schools and you said something now right. like you to say I mean, first of all i mean that whole so that children will not be maltreated bit mm -hmm. is also another assumption i okay. mean i have seen i mean if you've seen even if you've seen like videos online you've seen children in special schools mm -hmm. treated horribly that's as we've seen special schools that do yes. amazing jobs we've seen special schools that do terrible jobs mm -hmm. so it's a that one is a people problem mm -hmm. If, as long as human beings that are running the special exactly. school mm -hmm. and it's human beings that are running your inclusive school, the, the, you know, the risk of the child being treated unfairly is just there. It's pretty you know, even. And then I always just have a simple question. I mean, I don't have, I've gotten to a point in the course of my work where I always say it's up to parents. Whatever you think is best for your child, that's fine. I mean, if you want a special school, go ahead. Um, but I will always be an advocate for inclusive education because I always have a simple question. I mean, um, so the special schools do a good job of cocooning your child into an environment where everything is done for them and everything is set up, you know, in the way that works for them. Question, when they're done in those special schools mm -hmm. and special whatever, do you have a special world set for them? For them? For them. I mean, when are they going to learn 
to, you know, integrate mm -hmm. into the existing structure of our world. Um, I always say, look, if you have a disability, culture shock will hit you at some point, point. or the mm -hmm. other. The earlier I hit you, I think the better. I mean, I remember that I, when, I first, um, when I first went to school, for the first time, okay, there was nobody to carry me. So I had to figure out how to move around. It wasn't necessarily nice. I think I must have cried like <laughs> a couple of days. But after a while, well, I figured it out, made friends, moved on. Now, imagine if I had been probably cocooned in a special school, like my parents had been advised. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I was getting all of the help and everything. And everything was kind of, of course, there'll be ramps. If it's a special school, there'll be ramps. There'll be, so yes, I would not have had to deal with the stairs and all of those. And then I came out of a special school at maybe seven. So. You know, I'd be nice. I don't want to imagine the, the culture shock. <laughs> I don't imagine the culture shock at something that I hit mm -hmm. me. Now having to try to navigate how to climb stairs, or then now how to make friends with people who don't have disabilities. Exactly. Because the thing is, if I'm in the special school, so most of the people I see every day, apart from my teachers, are people like myself, right, who have disabilities. And then I'm going to come out of the special school. Unfortunately, there's no special university, so it's either mm -hmm. you're not planning that I'll go to university, so maybe I'm supposed to go to a trade school after that. Except you're going to create a, a separate trade school, and then I will now be trading with only people like only myself. <laughs> well, I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I always say, to each his own, right? Mm -hmm. You know, live and let leave. But I always say, you know what, just think about what exactly you want for your child, child. in the next 15 to 20 years. So, not just about what works now. Mm -hmm. But what's going to work for your child in the next 15, 20, yes. and five years when you're no longer here? I mean, those are the, those are the questions I always ask parents. Mm -hmm. and, and so I always say, while you're making that decision, just you know, think ahead and plan think about ahead. It. Mm -hmm. Think about the it. Training is important at a very early age. It is. It's very important. The earlier, the, the earlier, better. the better. OK, so are there laws you know, put ah. in place for people that maltreat children oh. living with oh, yeah. cerebral palsy? Generally, for people living with disabilities, generally, there is the Lagos State Special Persons Law. It was passed in 2011. 11, and it covers yeah. everything from access to buildings to, you know, um, disabled parking to, um, you know, discrimination on basis of disability. It pretty much, it's an entire law that you know, prohibits the discrimination and maltreatment of people living with disabilities in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. And so that law has been there. And you know, part of the implementation of the law is the creation of the office, the Lagos State Office of Disability Affairs, mm -hmm. LASUDA, that's supposed to implement the law. Um, well, implementation, like I always say, the devil is always in the implementation mm -hmm. of anything. Nigeria has beautiful laws. I'm a lawyer, I know. Um, we write beautiful laws in this country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, if you read, if you take our laws and you read them side by side with laws that were written in America, laws that were written in Britain, trust me, some of our laws are way better. Mm -hmm. Like, we cover the loopholes. We're pretty good at writing good laws. Good laws. The problem is always it's implementing. Implementing, law. implementing. And so that's kind of the same thing with our, you know, legal state special persons law. It's a beautiful law. Oh, yeah, I'm a bit biased as part of people who wrote it. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's the implementation. Implementation. Okay. And even if, even that's even if we are aware of these laws, mm, because laws, sometimes yes. we are not aware of the laws that are, have been put in place for True. us. You get so True. I think implementation and knowing what the laws say, See, how yes. it protects us, yes. is also important. Yes, so awareness of actually that the law even exists and then what it contains mm -hmm. is also very important. Yeah, okay, and, you know, moving into the adolescent age, yeah, how do children living with cerebral palsy, you know, handle peer pressure? and differences? Uh, I think you pretty much handle the, every, the way everybody else handles handle it. it. Okay. If you were raised to stand your ground, you stand your ground. Mm -hmm. If you were raised to be a yes person, <laughs> you follow the trend. Okay, the only thing that might be a bit, is, a bit harsh, you know, to handle as a teenager might be the taunting. Um, and the name calling, it gets worse um, in teenage because it just gets worse in teenage. It's not... People always think, oh, it's because the child has a disability. I say, not necessarily. Generally, teenagers are just funny people. We give each other nicknames. We call each other names as exactly. teenagers. It's just almost normal mm -hmm. in teenagers. So if you now have something that even gives them an, an easy access to call it's your names, call it's names. just worse. <laughs> it's just a little bit extra. But, uh, but again, it's always perception of value. 
um, which is why I always tell parents to teach their children how valuable they are very early on. And it's always about finding what your child's strengths are and then magnifying those strengths to the dwarf their weaknesses. So a lot of people will see me and they don't remember that I have cerebral palsy until I'm forced to remind them. Like, so my friends would do things like we're working down the street and they're working really fast. And I have to be like, uh, people, friend with cerebral palsy here, can we slow down? Like, to be sorry, like we totally forgot. And when they say we totally forgot, I'm just like, that's fine. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Job done. You're supposed to forget. To forget, right? yes. Um, because it means that my, my disability does not dominate our relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to them, I'm just one of them. And it's not really about disability. And that is always about perception of value. So it's always been about what I bring to the table, not what I don't bring to it. And so it's important that, you know, again, prepare your child for teenagers. It really starts with what you've done with them when they were young. Have you taught them about their own values so that when they're going into these really pair intense situations, they know when to say no. They know when to say, I'm not doing that. They know when to say, it's not by force to belong, you know and things like that. So it's important that in those conversations you start to have them, but not just have them in terms of talk about Internet, them, yeah. but you model it mm -hmm. even in the way that you're raising them. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, earlier on, you mentioned names calling like Abir and mm -hmm. all that. How were you able to deal with people the, calling, calling you names. such names? <laughs> Again, I mean, it's going to sound like a refrain. <laughs> It's the understanding of value. People will say anything. Mm. I remember in my first year, when I was walking down the street, as usual, like girls had jumped out of their hostels to stare at me. Because this thing, this thing was so funny, my part one. Must be like, you know what I used to tell myself? Celebrity status. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was so easy. And then, because think about it, you're coming out of your room, you know, and like, yeah, so you decide to think of the positive way of what my own. I come out of my room. And then you start hearing them say, she's coming, she's coming. And then they'll start jumping out of their hostels, power oh all night. There, so everybody, and then they will now line the sheets, not be staring, they'll be passing comments. And then one day, I was passing, and somebody said, hey, God forbid, if it was my family that they gave it to this kind of child, they'd have killed us since. I just wow. won't even get here. Wow. Do you know, I heard that comment. And interestingly, the person made that comment in Europe, but mm -hmm. thinking I was able to so understand. understand. Mm -hmm. I heard, I honestly did not run. I walked away. Next thing, that same day, I, I was a part one student. I was still finding my way around school. So I got lost. I was looking for my class, and then I f ended up around Anatomy Lab. I mean, you can imagine how far, mm -hmm, how far Anatomy Lab be. is from mm -hmm. the law faculty. <laughs> <laughs> so lucky for me, one of my roommates is a medical student. So she was in the Anatomy Lab at that time, and she just saw me from the window. So she came out and was like, what are you doing here? Yeah. Like, your <laughs> car is not even near this area. So, like, are you lost? I was like, yes, I'm lost. I'm looking for blah, blah, blah. Somebody now asked her from the window, like, in your bag again, like, where did you find the liability from? So she grabbed me from there and, just, you know, dragged me out. She didn't want me to hear the rest of the mm -hmm. conversation. But for me, I, I just smiled at it all because I was like, you know what? You're lost, so, because we will know who is the liability at the end of this semester. Yes. Yes. my own. Yes. Exactly. Like... You know, I mean, you imagine those kind of people now mm -hmm. coming back to meet you, probably when preparing for exams. Of course. And like then they do not understand something, mm -hmm. then they have to come this and meet you. It happened. Like, I was, my room was three hours and for my class. Like, so it happened. And I knew it was going to happen, happen. because I already knew that I knew how to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was me that it was already well known that I had one skill. I can, if I know it, I can teach it. So I knew it was going to eventually happen. Happen. Uh -uh. I'm waiting for you people. <laughs> so, that, we don't need to wait for exam. <laughs> test Stop to come me. back. Just come. <laughs> and I will not be next. Nice. That's the funny thing. So when you tell you now come, I'll be like, come man. Come. <laughs> Sit down. Uh -uh. She really <laughs> have to to me. You live in welcome. How did you know? You know, the interesting thing was, because I didn't make, it, make a fight out of it, these mm -hmm. people are my biggest share leaders till today. Today. I mean, I remember that there was one of... The okay, so one of the staring group at some point she couldn't take it anymore. I think, like, the third or fourth day they had done this whole staring mm -hmm. drama. She now said, Come, you people, me, I'm not staring again. Me, I need yeah. to ask this girl a few questions. So I was coming back from class one of the days, and then she was waiting for me outside. She said, So I was she said, You know what, please come. I went to her, and then she said to me, What's your name? I told her, She said, Oh, yeah, everybody. I said, Yes, I said, Do you understand the language? I said, Yes, she said, Good. 
what exactly are you doing here? I looked at her. The same thing you're doing here, getting an education. Exactly. She was like, where do you live as in our home? I was like, Lagos. She was like, so your parents left, all, left Lagos all the way to Edo State to bring you to school. They must be very wicked people. I said, oh, if that's your definition of wicked, then your understanding is limited. That's fine. Um, <laughs> that was that was a shame, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, I'm, I know how some people quiet. You know, it's okay. I mean, it's okay for you to understand mm -hmm. to have limited understanding you know, about something. That could help exactly. most times because it yes. makes you stand your ground and yes. that's do right. not let them see you. Like. I'm like, it's okay. That that's how you think about it. So I'm to say you think about it like that. I'm there in your head, right? Mm -hmm. That's okay, but. If you think that they are wicked, well, you know, that size is limited, but that's fine. And then, of course, after that conversation, when she said, what exactly is even wrong with you, Seth? Oh, I said, oh, that? Oh, I have cerebral palsy. I was like, and then I knew her. So I was like, wait, you're in a quest class, aren't you? So my roommate is a quest. She's like, yes. I was like, good. So you probably have an embryology textbook. If you check in there, you find it. <laughs> because it kind of affects babies. <laughs> At that point, obviously, I respect for me when I love from, like, Minus yeah, zero yeah, to like a thousand percent. She immediately became a, the next person that even tried to make a negative comment. Actually, she does not have time. Mm -hmm. She can't. She's she would, tall. She would even she's very tall. So you know, <laughs> you know when somebody, you know somebody stands to stands up to you and looks at you like okay. you were about to mm -hmm. say. <laughs> so immediately, like, like I'm, I'm ready to give, give you, you any so ready. Oh yes, yeah, you talk first now. Oh, yeah. so, stare. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden, all the taunting just died down. Mm -hmm. But again. It could have gone another way another if way. I had made it something to fight about yes. mm -hmm. instead of an opportunity for opportunity, an education. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I made sure that, and that's my attitude to, you know, when people say funny things. Mm -hmm. I believe that if people know better, they will do better. They're yes. only saying what they know. Mm -hmm. So why should I be angry that people don't know? Mm -hmm. And then I can take it as an opportunity for education and educate yes, them. them. Because again, we're a very cultural society and very religious. It's what they've been told. I mm -hmm. mean, I've had parents come to me who, their children are displaying things that are normal because they have cerebral palsy and they think it's a spiritual it's attack. A attack. And I'm thinking, no, your child doesn't have a spiritual attack. Your child is doing that because your child has cerebral palsy. It's mm -hmm. normal. We all do it. I do it. And so, again, this is the mother of the child, even thinking her child is possessed. Mm -hmm. So, what more somebody outside? Outside, mm -hmm. yes. So, again, people don't know. So, why should I get angry for their ignorance? Mm -hmm. It's my job to, to educate, educate and right. enlighten them. All right, there was something you said earlier on which is, that got my attention, which is, you know, your parents making sure that you still do the normal things that every other person in the house does. Yes. Now, how do you think parents can strike a balance between monitoring the education of that child mm -hmm. and also making sure that the child is socially active and imbibing moral values into that child? How do you do it with every other child in your house? Same thing. Same way. Okay. Same way. Mm -hmm. Will you make accommodations? Yes. yes. So, for instance, maybe your other kids would walk down the streets to do something. Maybe you might have to drive your child with mm -hmm. um, cerebral palsy to do it. But, hey, same way. So there's no... I always say, like, it's not... Like, every time people ask my dad this question, my dad's like, I don't know what people are talking about. I raised that like, I raised everybody every else. We person. had the same rules mm -hmm. in the house. That was all. And the rest, we just use common sense. Like, things that require to enter bus, we know, okay, we have to drive mm -hmm. her. Um, things that might, like, that my can break, okay, we know, okay, so Toby does not wash glass things because she likes, she can shake and mm -hmm. break it. Okay, so we remove all the glass from the this thing and put the other things and she wash it. Those ones, when they fall down, she'll pick it up and continue. And like, it's not, that is things, not rocket okay science. Mm -hmm. Moral values, how did you teach moral values to everybody else? Teach her the same way. Simple. And then mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, same thing with education. Everybody went to school. These are our educational standards as a family. Mm -hmm. And see, take these are the educational standards I expected of you. So we're not reducing the standard for you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Somewhere in our heads, we know mm -hmm. you might not. Okay. But again, in their heads, maybe okay. Maybe if she doesn't, but we'll not tell Asha. Mm -hmm. And then actually surpass their expectations for academics. So, I mean, I remember my my dad saying when he got the letter from school that I had fallen into the gifted children category. He <laughs> was shocked and surprised. Okay. Are they shocked? Sure? <laughs> like, he showed my mom. My mom was like, eh, wait, maybe they meant, maybe they mistakenly wrote the wrong name on this letter. I'm taking this letter to school tomorrow. I always ask them. Okay. And then we found out it was true. So, right. you know, yeah. 
So then you, get, you know that that question is actually important. Again, because of the notion people have, yeah. mm. like they have to treat one particular but child, child in a special yes. way. Yes. Exactly. And then they create more problems for that child in the end. Okay. And she mentioned yeah. that you have to create a special world for that child. <laughs> no, you will. Because eventually that. you will raise an entitled child. Mm -hmm. Oh, Which no, is really. actually more costly. More. You know, yes, because so. charge the title, yes. so it's more costly. Okay, all right. So, Thank you so much. Now, You're welcome. producer is saying that the time is fast, best. Yeah, we have, have to, to wrap, wrap up. up. Okay. It's been an amazing time here. Thank you so much for coming to You're the Baba Ajayi. Yes. Uh, on these notes, we have to wrap up the show. Mm -hmm. But then again, you can join us same time, same station tomorrow for another exciting episode. My name remains Mudupe Jacobs. And I am Raola Popola. And do not forget that your personal yes. values mm -hmm. is what you stand for and makes you stand your ground. Thank you for staying tuned. Till meet again. Bye. Bye.